So good afternoon, good noon, or good morning, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Sheldon, a faculty member of the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures, University of Illinois, and from Champaign. Um, my special thanks go to our UIUC affiliates. I know you're all enjoying your summer break that started in mid-May. Uh, I really appreciate your spending time with us today. Uh, this is the fourth event of our online speaker series titled Yellow Peril Redux from Coolies to uh, Incarceration Camps, Trade Wars, and Coronavirus, uh, funded by UIUC Chancellor's Office, Call to Action to Address Racism and Social Injustice Research Program, UIUC, co-sponsored by the Center for East Asian and Pacific Studies, the Center for Advanced Studies, and Asian American Culture Center of UIUC. So let me briefly introduce what the project program is, and I will pass it on to today's uh, chair, Dr. Shen Chen of uh, Royal Ontario Museum. The rhetoric of Yellow Peril dates to the so-called Asian invasions of the late 19th century. The COVID-19 pandemic inspired a resurgence of this rhetoric and its social consequences. Our project, situates yellow power in the U.S. as a history of systemic racism complicated by the U.S. East Asian relations and by mutual misunderstandings between cultures. We study its historical moments and contemporary developments, cultural expressions and social consequences. This project draws on uh, research and teaching expertise on UIUC campus and extends our relationships with community members inside and outside of Illinois. The project started uh, with a, uh, in July 2020 when Chancellor Jones announced a $2 million annual commitment by UIUC to provide support for research and the expansion of community-based knowledge that advances the understanding of systematic racism and generationally embedded racial disparity. Okay, let me show you some slides here. Uh, there's my slide, a second. About our project, about our program, and this is our team, including professors, scholars, students, community leaders uh, from UIUC and outside of UIUC. And my special thanks go to our coordinator, Ms. Liu Yang Yang, and our outreach partner, Ms. Michelle Zhang, the, uh, the, the, the founder of an Asian American NGO in California called the Society of uh, the Heart's Delight. And also uh, I want to introduce to you today that uh, a part of our project includes a museum exhibition on local uh, Asian American history uh, led by um, Dr. Ian Wang, collaborating with our county's history museum. And our past events, very briefly, we have three events uh, from historian, uh, museum, sorry, documentary director and a, um, a justice in Hawaii. We have a link where you can find uh, videos of these three talks. Uh, Yang Yang, please uh, copy paste the link to our videos for the audience at the chat room. And announcement about the coming um, upcoming event on June 23rd, uh, 2 to 3 p.m. Central Time. Uh, the speaker will be uh, the famous Dr. Karen Kolematsu, daughter of Fred Kolematsu. Uh, she will talk about the, one of the most notorious U.S. Supreme Court decisions, uh, that is Kolematsu versus the US. Uh, hope to see you on that day. Now let me introduce today's chair, Dr. Shen Chen. Dr. Shen Chen is a co-chief curator of art and culture, Royal Ontario Museum. The Royal Ontario Museum preserves the largest collection of Chinese artifacts among North American museums and the second largest outside of China, um, second to the British Museum. Dr. Shen is responsible for managing and researching over 41,000 Chinese artifacts at the ROM, 
and he is curator his curatorial research focuses on making ancient Chinese culture relevant to our understanding of Chinese cultures in contemporary society. He is also very active in higher education and academia. He's a professor at the University of Toronto teaching courses on ancient Chinese uh, archaeology and technology and cultural materials in ancient China. He also is the author of uh, several books and many uh, academic journal articles. His most recent book titled Entering the World of Wonder, Thoughts on Contemporary Museums. Um, that's a very brief uh, introduction of many, many achievements he has made. Uh, for the sake of time, I will stop here. Dr. Shen, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sao, and uh, welcome everyone. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. And uh, it is my great pleasure to join this uh, program. Thanks for the invitation, and uh, and also I'm uh, apologize for my casual dressings uh, entering the uh, weekend mode out of town uh, for this very serious um, and the timely needed topic. I'm very fortunate to be joined by uh, four distinguished scholars and uh, curators, museum directors, mm -hmm. and artists. And uh, let me briefly um, mention them. Uh, we have uh, Dasha Shi, co-founders and directors of Kuanian's Contemporary Art, Colorado, California. And Dasha is also a um, has a PhD in material science and engineers before turn herself uh, a to be a full-time and a talent artist and art advocate advocators. And uh, next, our presenter and our panelist is Jason Finkelman. Professor J uh, Jason Finkelman is a director of a Global Arts Perf uh, Performance Initiatives at the Cranet Centers for Performing Art. Um, Professor Finkelman also is a curator of uh, music, performance, and film for university-based institution, community festivals, and academic conference with over 22 years of arts programming and management at the University of Illinois. And uh, our next um, panelist is Dr. Jie Xu, uh, Director and CEO, Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. Uh, Jie is also an archeologist, has been working in many museums from the Seattle Art Museum to uh, Institute, of, uh, Institute of Art of Chicago. And we have been working very uh, closely in many projects and welcome uh, Jay again. And the last and not least, and we have our panelist, um, Xiao Jie Xu, the professor school of, uh, uh, professor from the School of Humanities and Sciences, Department of Art and Art History, Stanford University. And Xiao Zhu Xie is also an internationally recognized artist and, and has expert in many, you know, what recognized and what award exhibitions I would like to uh, let the Professor Xie to talk about that uh, yourself. Uh, so, uh, as you see, um, it will take me a very long time to give you more detail of their bios, uh, which I don't think we have time, but I definitely encourage everyone uh, should be Google each of our panelists, their uh, wonderful achievement, and while you can listen to their uh, thoughts and experience. So what I'm uh, trying to do today is, um, I would like to first in uh, invite our panelists to introduce themselves and to share their thoughts on this important uh, topic. And the well, I will raise uh, three sets of questions in the following time. And each set of questions has uh, many uh, areas, but uh, more provide a directional discussion rather than expecting our panelists to give the direct answers on that. Um, but definitely our parents have many different experience and many achievement that can be shared their thoughts and the point of view in areas like this. Um, so 
without further ado, let's get started. So my first um, the section is I like to uh, I like to invite our panelists to tell us a little bit about yourself and your work and some major works that you have experienced to raise the awareness of contemporary societies on art and culture of Asian Americans. So maybe I can start asking um, Dasha. Go ahead. Dasha, you have muted yourself. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shao, and thank you, Dr. Shen. So I will start to share on the screen. I will discontinue your sharing. Is that okay? Um, I just see a few words about my um, background. I have a tech background. So as Dr. Chen said, I have a degree in PhD, a PhD degree in material science and uh, worked in the industry for about eight years and several years in academia. And um, I, when I was a kid, I liked to read literatures. And then when I got in college and uh, uh, in the early time in Beijing, I think, you know, we start to see the Western art. And uh, so I got uh, interested in it. So for the last, you know, several decades, I have been looking at art and uh, I think art is so important for my life. It nurtures myself. So I would like to share. And I guess that's the reason I started uh, this gallery with my friend. So Kualia Contemporary Art um, is established actually in October, 2020. It's almost the darkest time in the pandemic. You know, we are in deep isolation. Everybody got locked at home and the anti-Asia crime was rising. So um, by that time, I remember one day, uh, my husband and I, we drove to University Avenue. It was totally vacant. And I saw in the video, you know, like London, Paris, it's all empty. I, I got so shocked. So I thought this is a good time, you know, to start a gallery. And uh, we don't want to just make it a typical commercial gallery. We want it to become a small cultural platform and that is internationally connected but deeply rooted in the community. Uh, so this is our vision. We want to become a bridge to connect the art world with Silicon Valley. I know most people say Silicon Valley is a tech center but it's a desert for art. I live here, I consider this is my home so I don't believe it. I think people here are very, you know, high IQ and uh, and I think they will embrace art. Um, we also want to become a link between the artists and the audience, especially with my tech background, I would like to share art with people with similar background. I want to encourage art appreciation and art connection. We want to enrich the culture of life and enhance the community harmony. So of course, our mission number one is showcasing outstanding artists with diverse ethnic and cultural background. And we want to have a focus on Asian, Asian American artists and women artists. I know for uh, most of my, you know, um, um, other galleries, they would advise me, you want to focus in a sp small niche, but this is um, our vision. We want to show all kinds of you know, outstanding artists, locally, nationally, internationally, and uh, with variety of media and with a diverse ethnic and cultural background. We want them intellectually, socially, and aesthetically engaging. So our second mission is make this a vital platform you know, you, with art as a catalyst to form a dialogue platform for the community and beyond. So we want it to be cross-racial, cross-ethnic and cross-cultural, interdisciplinary. We encourage in critical inquiries like this one. We formed a conversation between the artist and the astro astronomy you know, physics professor in Berkeley. So we want to uh, form all kinds of interesting conversation dialogue. We want to build a lasting 
and fruitful relationships with artists, audience, connectors, curators, scholars, and locally, national, and international. Um, so in the last three years, our approach is we want to carefully curate each exhibition. We want to present works by Asian Asian American artists, help people to understand Asian and AAPI. So when we have a fascinating show here, all kinds of people, you know, with ethnic, different ethnic background, they would come to visit us. And we want to support BLM. So we present works by African-American artists. So we believe that understanding is mutual and it's always a two-way channel. So AAPI is not a bystander. We are active participant of the American society. We have special event each year for the AAPI month. So we collaborate with local artists who we actually don't present in the gallery. We also want to explore important issues such as, you know, like environment issue, gender issue, and we juxtaposed of artworks created by different background of artists, you know, Asian American artists and other art artists. We invite people, all kinds of community people, you know, to come and to look at art, to enjoy art and live with art. So during the COVID time, we had a Zoom openings and uh, we have, now we have all kinds of events in the gallery. And we, we want to use this way to promote community harmony and uh, mutual understanding. We also want to form a strong connectors network. You know, we want to connect to existing art connectors. We want to develop new connectors, especially encourage Asian and Asian American to become connectors because we believe, you know, only when we connect the art, then this period, the art of this period will be uh, conserved. And then, and we will see 40, 30, you know, 40, 50 years so later, we see this period of time. So we are making history. So in summary, we have in less than three years, we exhibited works of 42 artists, 18 local, 12 non-Bay Area artists, 12 international. Among all those artists, 20 artists are Asian and Asian American artists. So I think I probably ran out of my time. I have a few images, you know, this is the AAPI month events. And this is, you know, two Asian female artists, Yang Yi Pak and Stella Zhang. And this is the um, two African-American artists show curated by renowned uh, art historian, Alex Nemorov. And that's the other artist in this uh, African-American artist exhibition. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Dasha. And uh, certainly uh, I totally get uh, your, from your presentation. You know, usually people has a perception about art gallery is the only place for displaying art, but what you just present as what you have done is really you present art gallery is a network, it's the core centers for artists, for communications and raise the ideas and make the network. So thank you very much for that introduction. So our next presenter, Jason, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, part of this panel, um, representing the University of Illinois as a curator. And I'll just say that I'm a fourth generation Japanese American, um, half Japanese, um, and I live my life as a curator here at the University of Illinois and as a performing artist and uh, creator. Um, I've done an extensive work with uh, creating music for dance with Cynthia Oliver and other choreographers. And, um, and I lead an ensemble called Kuroshio currently, which is a uh, ever evolving music ensemble. Uh, we have a CD that was released on Asian Improv Records, uh, self-titled release with Joy Yang and Alan Wu um, in 2020. And the ensemble has uh, <clears throat> evolved to include Joy Yang with Saori Kataoka on trumpet and um, Kavi Naidu on saxophones and flutes. And we have some videos online, <clears throat> excuse me, of recent performances 
But what I'd like to share mostly today um, is the work that I've done here recently with the Spurlock Museum and in an exhibition called Nikkei Jean, Illinois. And um, maybe just, I'll just show you two slides of that very briefly and, um, and we'll, So this is uh, just the opening panel of Nikkei Jean, Illinois. Oh, and that disappeared. Is that on the screen now? The, the view of the gallery? Okay, great. So this is just kind of a, a larger look at the gallery and you'll see that there's um, some artifacts from the incarceration experience. You'll see in the background that there's panels featuring 12 um, profiles of former students, faculty, and staff at the University of Illinois. And through these profiles, we uh, tell a broad story, a dynamic story of the Japanese American experience, the historical experience. And uh, I don't have pictures of the other aspects of the um, exhibition uh, in, in long view, but maybe later in this uh, presentation, I can show uh, some images from uh, 12 profiles out of 20 from an exhibition that premiered in Philadelphia called American Pearl, which was a 2017 response. I'll stop sharing my screen here. Um, was a 2017 response to anti-Muslim um, policies that were going on uh, at that time. And there are there's a collection of objects of uh, anti-Asian hate, historical objects. And in American Pearl, um, these some of these objects are being held by contemporary people, and 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 they're responding to that. So um, th that would be, in my opinion, an example of uh, portrait art um, dealing with issues of anti-Asian hate and uh, addressing and and addressing the ways in which we can um, create art and respond to this moment. Um, so hopefully I'll have a chance to speak a little bit about um, the artists that are involved. Maybe I'll just say briefly that representative of the 12 profiles of people who've been part of the institution, um, one of our earliest uh, profiles is of Toichi Domoto, and the Domoto family was very famous in San Francisco for um, having one of the first nurseries, and uh, he on display in his profile is some of the bonsai trees that that he raised um, and adopt and, and had re acquired from his father before him. Um, Hideo Sasaki is featured, a landscape, a very well known and famous landscape architect. Momoko Iko, who's a playwright who found her voice through the voices of the African American community in. Um, she was based in Chicago, and she was one of the first playwrights to have a syndicated, uh, a nationally syndicated play on PBS. Um, and Ray Sazaki is also featured in the exhibition, who's a jazz trumpeter. So we have musicians, playwrights, and other types of artists uh, represented it, represented in the twelve profiles um, as part of the historical narrative. So I'll leave it there, and hopefully I could say a little more about some of the pieces in the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Yes, definitely you are coming back with other uh, experience you have while, uh, following our uh, questions uh, later. So next one, uh, Dr. Jay Xu, go ahead. Hello, uh, hi everyone. Thank you, Chen, and thank you uh, colleagues uh, in the uh, University of Illinois for inviting me to participate in this very important forum. Um, I'm a first generation immigrant I've been uh, the director of the Asia Museum for the last 15 years. Uh, many things have happened in this landmark museum. We have overcome uh, tremendous challenges and also have had unprecedented growth. And particularly relevant to today's topic is our growth in terms of doubling our mission by including Asian American art and culture as the core. Uh, mission of our museum. And uh, this is particularly timely in the last several years during the pandemic with the rise of uh, anti-Asian hate and uh, rampant racism against all minorities. Asian Museum has taken very firm leadership in being a platform, a voice, and also particularly a platform for artists and to collaborate and to uh, express 
and the what the community champions. So uh, in order to do that, we also have uh, transformed our campus and uh, we have a large uh, um, growth in terms of our physical space. As you can tell uh, the uh, backdrop of my virtual uh, background, this is our newly expanded um, uh, facility. And uh, uh, the reason I chose this picture in particular is because uh, that embodies uh, our ambition to turn the museum inside out, that the museum's walls are no longer only protective barrier, but also they are the first galleries facing our community. And you can tell there are several murals uh, outward facing. On the pedestrian level, it's by a Filipino-American woman artist, Jennifer Wolford. And on the uh, level above, inside the glass lounge, but the man to be seen from the outside, is a mural by Chinese American artist Chanel Miller, and above on our uh, all door art terrace, the mural by Indian American women artist Charles Charanjiva. They are all about fighting for social justice, particularly women's rights, as well as commemorate the former generations of the Asian American artistic leaders. So there are a lot to talk about, and but I know I want to be very conscious of our time. So let me leave it here. And besides the Asian Art Museum responsibilities, I'm also um, involved in several other organizations. Locally, I'm a founding board member for the, um, the Center uh, for the uh, Chinatown Arts and Media Collaborative. This is a organization formed by six longstanding Chinatown community organizations. Idea is to use arts and media and at the intersection of uh, social community engagement, and also for the economic uh, uh, revitalization. So that's uh, the local engagement. And uh, the nationally, recently I was appointed by the Congress to serve on the Congressional Commission to study the feasibility of a national museum of Asian, Ameri Asian Pacific American history and culture. And this is a monumental task, will take many, many years, but every journey starts with first step to find our home, our communal home on the National Mall in Washington, DC. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jay, for your uh, great efforts in, uh, in all these uh, political and economic uh, foreign voices in the Asian communities and advocated for the change of society. So next, uh, of course, it's the last but not least, uh, Professor uh, Shea, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Shen. Thank you, Dr. Sao and everyone else. Um, I'm um, thrilled to be here for this important uh, symposium. Uh, my name is uh, Xie Xiaozi. Uh, I grew up in Southern China and uh, uh, did my earlier training in architecture and uh, public art uh, in Beijing. Uh, I came to the States in 1992, and I started exhibiting my work and also pursue a career as uh, an art teacher. Um, I came to Stanford, I joined Stanford faculty um, in 2009, and um, I'm, the department uh, is called the Department of Art and Art History. I teach art practice, so uh, I'm an artist, not an art historian. So my main medium uh, is painting. Although I've also done works uh, in other forms like installation, photography, uh, and video. I also finished a documentary film that is part of my project. Um, my recent uh, projects are based on research, and uh, I attempt to combine scholarship with creativity and uh, you know, bridge uh, contemporary ideas with traditional forms and materials. Uh, so most of these are, are complex, you know, um, oftentimes uh, either mixed media or multimedia um, projects. Uh, one uh, focuses on the history of censorship in China and also uh, globally. Um, and uh, the most recent project I'm working on is uh, focusing on the history and the content of the library cave in Dunhuang. And it is a project to confront um, fragmentation and uh, dispersal and, and trauma in uh, China's cultural history. Uh, so 
overall, I would say that my work has a lot to do with uh, time, memory, and history, and uh, has, you know, almost always um, uh, confronted the vulnerability of uh, culture. Thank you. And I will mention that uh, in my back, this is my studio, and uh, in my background, these are two recent installations uh, related to the last project I mentioned, um, the library cave in Dunhuang. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor, I'm also aware that your recent work with uh, on your work associated with the uh, COVID pandemic um, issues that are, you know, in a collaboration to, uh, in a Wuhan. So uh, it'd be very good to hear about that uh, in the future that we have a moment. So uh, let's move on to our um, one of the three sets of questions. As you can see, uh, the question is a little bit long, but it's not really the questions that I'm uh, seeking for the answers directed to those. Uh, but however, it is the directional uh, areas that we can focus on our discussions for the next 15 minutes. The Yellow Pearl is a long history of a systemic uh, racism in the American societies as the project or whoever has been uh, participating in our project before, you can see it's already demonstrated uh, that issue is a problem and we are continuous to fight over the systematic uh, sy systemic uh, racism. The whole world just experienced another wave of anti-Asian uh, redux and especially over the uh, COVID. And uh, of course, when we hit the bottom, we always know there is a rebound. So um, my questions to our panelists is, what changes in, in this coming eras of post-COVID that can post the challenges and opportunities for creating and presenting arts um, by the Asian Americans from your experience observations on that? So I may invite it, uh, Jay um, first to speak because I know you are in a leadership that are changing the directions in the museum field along with the art. Uh, maybe you can start sharing that and we can follow the suits. Go ahead, Jay. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm really uh, encouraged by the very strong vocal expression of Asian American communities in the last several years fighting against anti-Asian uh, hate and racism while coping with the tremendous challenges of COVID. And uh, I think going forward, the important challenge as well as opportunity is to sustain that momentum. So I'm very grateful that the University of Illinois is organizing this ongoing uh, panel. This is, is part of the, the, uh, the nationwide effort that we need to sustain in terms of uh, um, continuing the momentum. And so that is the one area. The second, I think like our museum and many other organizations, including art galleries, that um, the art is the most powerful tools of culture and social expressions. And the art has the ability of uh, break down boundaries and reaching out to people's hearts and mind. So I think actively showcasing the diverse voices of Asian American art is very important because Asian American art is American art. I think that is a very important part of the exercise. And thirdly, in my own effort, I, uh, another organization I, uh, I'm serving with is the Terra Foundation for American Art. So, um, and I'm by training, as you know, that I'm an Asianist. I'm uh, studying with Asian China and archaeology. So why I'm serving on a board whose mission is about American art. Because exactly as I said, the Asian American art is also American art, but there's not enough adequate representation and inclusion of Asian American art in the canon of American art. So part of my vision, mission, and I think I'm doing so on behalf of the community is to redefine, expand the canon of American art by being more inclusive. And this effort not only should focus on the art, living artists that we are working with today, who should go back to the former generation as well, because ever since the first immigration of Asians into this continent, there are artistic expressions. Some of them started right here in San Francisco, 
for example, in the Angel Island immigration stations, the poems, the, uh, uh, the, the pictures that are carved on the walls, these are the expression of artistic sensibility in the spirit of fighting against discrimination. So I think both historical from past to the present, but also we need to work with all allyship across all the communities to paint a bad picture. And art is the best of both. That's great. Um, that's definitely that's a good segue to let me ask uh, Jason. Jason, through your you know engagement with the communities and uh, how do you see the various form of art and the, to build into the um the the ideas of and uh, uh, Asian American movement that uh, in your different communities and your work that you have done before the COVID and after COVID. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me go back and share my screen. I think um, what um, uh, Director Shi has just uh, spoke about, about poetry and so forth, ties into this panel. Um, so let me go back to this panel. Um, what you're seeing is uh, one of the cases of um, on display. And this these two pieces in the foreground, uh, the Burl Wood art and the uh, and the panel, uh, are from my grandfather's collection that got passed down to my mother. Um, now the wood panel art poem, we did not know any of the history of this piece, and 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 after putting it on display, I've learned a little more, and and. Um, and this also ties into sort of this historical role of the uh, Japanese American um, incarcerees turning to art practices uh, to, you know, to focus their time to make their time more well spent and meaningful while they were in prison during World War II. So um, let me just. Um, say that when we put this on display, the photograph in the middle is my mother from her high school uh, uh, prom or something. And in the background, you can't really see it in this image, but in the background, you see this piece on the wall. So um, that would be in the late 50s or early 60s, but we're probably the early 60s. So, um, but we, we wrote that uh, the origin story of this exceptional wood panel carving is unknown but the style of bas relief carving using wooden planks is a noted artistic practice during the Japanese American incarceration experience. And the, this work was identified by myself as hanging on the wall in the Miyahara home in photographs from the mid sixties. Uh, most of the calligraphy in the work is indecipherable, but the characters uh, on, the, on the left, and I'm gonna show a close up of this in a minute, uh, represent uh, Sanju Sangendo, a Buddhist temple in Kyoto, Japan. And so that was clearly seen by many people. Um, and then Ame is the character for rain is also very visible, but the, um, the rest of that panel wasn't known. What was really amazing is that um, uh, I'm going to jump ahead and then I'm going to jump back. What's amazing about this panel when we opened the show on February 19th to uh, coincide with the uh, anniversary of the signing of Executive Order 9066 by President Roosevelt, um, which basically uh, initiated the, uh, the military exclusion zones in California on the West Coast and, and initiated the incarceration experience. Um, on February 18th, before the show even opened, I, I received an email from a University of Illinois colleague, uh, Jean uh, Piero Persiani. And uh, I was so thrilled to receive this email because not only did he translate the, the, the calligraphy, but he also let us know who the artist was. So I will say that he, he reported to me that the inscription is in fact a haiku published in 1897 by Ono uh, Sachiku, uh, who uh, was alive from 1872 to 1913. 
And so the name appears in red uh, in the bottom left. And the poem is uh, Subakuru Ya, Sanju Sangendo no Ame. And that translates as swallows, rains on the eaves of Sen, Sanju Sangendo Temple. So um, I'm gonna go back to this slide and tell a little bit of a story um, that uh, in, in preparing for this conversation today came to my attention. Um, in, in 2015, there was an auction of items such as this um, and other artifacts from the Japanese American incarceration experience that went on sale at auction um, from the collection of Alan H. Eaton. Now, Alan H. Eaton in 1945 collected these items or started collecting these items when he visited um, the incarceration camps. And um, in 1952, he published a, a book called Beauty Beyond Barbed Wire, The Arts of the Japanese in Our War Relocation Camps. And uh, this image here is uh, from a digital copy of that book. Um, and you see it's a very similar type of panel with, in this case, a paper poem uh, uh, attached to the wooden panel. But the shape is very much the same and, um, and is listed as camp art. Now, on the prior page, I want to just read a little bit that says in his book, uh, every war relocation center had its poetry societies with contests sometimes extending to other camps. The decorated wooden panel shown here was made for a prize winner from Minidoka, Idaho, where it was photographed. The panel is thought to have been made at Tule Lake, California, because of the shells used to represent plum blossoms. The poem may be in the handwriting of the verse maker, but is more likely to have been done by a camp calligrapher as his contribution to the poetry award. In the foreground, resting on a branch, is a small warbler carved from wood and painted green. So um, I, I just find it remarkable to learn more about the story of tracing the history of this panel that my own family, since my grandfather did not speak of these histories. Um, and actually, he threw this panel in the trash, as the story goes, and my mother recovered it as they were relocating from uh, Bridgeton, New Jersey to San Diego, California, after retiring from a careers at Seabrook Farms after the war. So even in this very brief uh, description of this one piece, there's there's a lot of history. Now, what had happened to this collection of, um, of uh, 450 objects? They ended up at the uh, Japanese American uh, uh, National Museum in Los Angeles. Um, you know, after nearly more than 7,000 Japanese Americans or, or, or folks petitioned the, you know, wanted to stop the auction because our culture should not be sold, our heritage isn't for sale, and that these items need to be preserved and, and the stories of these items need to be told. So thank you for giving me a chance to share that. Um, if I may, let me just jump through a couple other things that that one would see at this exhibition that is up. Now these these uh, parasols were created um, after the war period, but from a woman who uh, in Seabrook Farms, who uh, likely learned this at the um, during the incarceration period. And this object here is an object from the Ross Hirano family. It's a letter box that was created during the war, and it represents those who served in the military with the flag. And, and there were seven of his relatives who served in World War II uh, in the military intelligence service and in, in um, other, uh, in the 442. Uh, here's a close up of that. Um, and then lastly, to maybe we can look at this later, but just in Chu uh, and uh, Rob Busher, whose items of, uh, anti-Asian hater on display, created these profiles, these portraits of, of contemporary people holding uh, these historical objects of hate. 
and commenting on those. So I'll end there. I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, thank you for, for letting me share a little bit of the exhibition. Thank you very much, Jason, for this uh, story. It's very touching and it's very emotional. And I certainly want to reiterate it that the culture is not for sale. Um, I think that's a very good point. And definitely I'm glad that you brought it up about that auction house. We're all facing that uh, situation from time to time. So for time's sake, I'd like to move on for uh, the, the direct question to uh, Professor Shea, I know you spend most of your time in 2021 preparing and making the panorama of internal night. And uh, you'd like to talk about that? Yes, thank you so much for mentioning that for this uh, opportunity. May I share my screen? Um, so does that go to slideshow? Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I would like to uh, talk, respond to the question uh, as uh, an artist, um, uh, ones who uh, make objects, make work. Um, I think in a at a time of uh, that is full of misconception and conflict and hostility. Um, I think artists does have opportunities uh, because I think at such times art could be an important channel for understanding between different peoples. And because art, trans, art appears to the senses, you know, visual or audio. Um, so art could, to a certain degree, transcend languages and uh, cultural differences. And that's my overall belief. So during the pandemic, um, I make a very um, distinctive body of work uh, entitled Panorama of Eternal Night. And uh, that project includes um, a monumental painting composed of uh, five panels, uh, measuring up to about uh, 28 feet long. And uh, as you can see this painting, uh, different images and scenes about the uh, fighting against the pandemic um, are drawn from different countries and regions, uh, India from the left, and then New York, um, Europe, uh, China, uh, Latin America. There are also a wide range of references to art history. So um, from the left, you can um, recognize perhaps uh, on the background, um, there is a quoted uh, a portion of a mural Tang, from Tang Dynasty in uh, from Dong Huang, which is uh, Cave uh, 158, depicting how the disciples of the Buddha were devastated by the passing of the Buddha. Uh, and it's juxtaposed with a group of uh, Chinese nurses uh, trying to comfort each other at the time of uh, emotional distress. Now to the very right end of the uh, panorama painting, I quoted uh, Giotto's uh, famous work, Lamentation of Christ. And uh, I desaturated uh, the uh, very colorful painting into, uh, you know, almost uh, muted and, and um, very close to a uh, black and white kind of image with the, uh, you know, particularly the part of uh, uh, Christ and, and Mary were painted a very faint in a ghostly kind of way. And um, this quoted image was uh, juxtaposed with um, a painting depicting uh, scenes of black death and then contemporary imagery. So what I'm trying to say here is that, um, you know, we are the same human being. We share the same fate, you know, we, we are fighting the same battle. And um, so uh, I hope that uh, it is through this work uh, people would realize that. So this is the, um, the image of the whole painting. And again, my idea of trying to blend um, contemporary imagery with uh, historical references uh, is quite typical here. In the background, you can see that also uh, the second panel is Goya's Sleep of Reason, 
and then uh, toward the center, uh, illustration for Dante's uh, Inferno by French artist Gaston Dolore. So um, uh, I wanted this piece to be uh, cross-cultural, uh, cross-geographical. Uh, uh, I also did a series of uh, ink uh, scroll drawings, what I call uh, journals, uh, based on different periods of uh, the pandemic. And um, I would also juxtapose uh, quoted images, like from the left, uh, uh, Cave 158, with uh, uh, news images that I found online in the uh, news media. So um, one other idea I have is that uh, uh, in uh, using these uh, art historical references, um, I think it's important to treat um, art from different periods, uh, from different cultures, different countries, as equal as equally important and significant. Uh, during the, the presentation of this body of work uh, at the uh, Ingram Chimbo Gallery in San Francisco, uh, that was uh, in January 2022, when Omicron was sweeping around uh, across America. And uh, I organized a uh, poetry reading because I also write uh, poems and so I but uh, in smaller numbers so um, I um, invited uh, Bay Area Asian American uh, poets uh, Genny Lim and uh, Clara Shi uh, to read uh, their works along with mine and I also invited uh, music, Gu Zhen musician David Wong uh, to play music at this gathering so it proved to be a very moving uh, event. And um, the, I, it was, uh, for me, an opportunity uh, to integrate art uh, with the community, uh, to integrate various uh, uh, forms of art, the visual, uh, you know, music, and uh, uh, poetry. And I, I remember that we actually uh, uh, read pieces in, um, for my pieces, uh, I recited in uh, Chinese while my translator, Clara, uh, read it in uh, English. So I, um, this is a, a corner uh, that I display um, my uh, thinking process and uh, source materials. And as you can see that there are a, a mixed range of, uh, of references from European to uh, Chinese uh, to uh, contemporary art as well. And those are on the wall are small uh, ink sketches that I did in this um, development of the, the idea and the composition. Another work that I did during the pandemic, um, there was a little bit earlier, uh, is a triptych, uh, three monumental ink drawings um, I titled uh, Western and uh, Eastern, well, Eastern and Western uh, Cosmologies. Um, and in this uh, uh, triptych, I combined different images uh, from uh, the 3D reconstruction, which I, I developed uh, from the uh, Dunhuang scroll, uh, put 3D construction of Buddhist cosmology with Dante's uh, structure of the universe. And I also combine various um, depictions of afterlife, you know, the heaven and, um, and hell. Uh, and all of these, I think they, they speak about the same humanity. Uh, they are across different cultures, but they spe speak about uh, human emotions. Uh, they speak of the same kind of longing for uh, happiness uh, and um, also, um, you know, the, uh, the endurance of uh, sufferings. So this is uh, the panel on the, on the right. If we read from right to left, I started with the uh, Buddhist cosmology, which I constructed and fit into the library cave, the space of the library cave of Dunhuang, uh, as if a grotto uh, is a world model, uh, according to uh, Buddhist theory. 
and then to to the left uh, uh, is the Dante's um, structure of a universe, which is also uh, very rigorous, and they are in fact very similar. Uh, then a lot of uh, references uh, from art found in the library cave and in Dunhuang, also um, European art. Uh, Doris uh, illustration. I also included more uh, images from art history. Uh, here in the center is uh, uh, 19th century uh, Qing Dynasty Tangka uh, painting uh, from, you know, it, it's a, a form of uh, Tibetan Buddhist art. Okay, so thank you for uh, your time. Oh, thank you. Um... Professor Shea uh, for sharing that wonderful works. And uh, I believe that those works are, are available viewing on your website. Am I right? Uh, some of them, the website needs uh, some updates. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So if anyone in our audience that would be interested in seeing the more details of Professor Shea's work, uh, please um, go to Google the website. We should be, I think I have seen some myself a little bit on that. I'm not okay. sure if so everyone there. Everything is there, but definitely you will get a good sense about those artworks. This speaks to the uh, social justice and the thoughts of the artist. I think this is a very good segue to the next question. So Yang Yang, if you can put the questions up. I think uh, um, all those works that uh, um, Professor Jason, uh, Jason uh, Pinkelmans and Professor Shays has been addressed your stories, has been all speak about the roles of the artist and the roles of the art curators, roles of the art and the culture in a contemporary society. That is why we're doing arts and why we being the curators, artists, and uh, art historians, museum leaders that we try to uh, reshape the world. So um, the questions in 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 this uh, in this uh, section is how could Asian artists portray a new images of Asia to diminish the Europro's perception. Uh, in my own experience, I uh, working with uh, the museum designers on various Asian exhibitions, I always feel that sometimes there has a perceptions about uh, how to portray the Asian art. You know, uh, the, uh, the the red lanterns and uh, um, you know, you know, uh, the uh, the. Uh, um, Buddhas or other images, but they have a very skewed uh, perceptions about how to portray. So I'd like to invite Dasha to speak a little about the empowering the uh, people and how this new era is in, in, to, to, to have our artists portray a new Asia, a new Asian American through the art uh, in your experience, Dasha. Uh, thank you. I think art and culture uh, empower people profoundly, and also it has a um, more universal language. Um, so, in my opinion, you know, it's not only the art that portrays the Asian image that matters. I think each individual's participation. I think you know, art basically comes from the true self of an artist. And uh, some artists, they are deeply related to their background. You know, like the, the show right now behind me, uh, Wang Tian De's Further Along. And he uh, clearly, you know, you can see the aesthetics of traditional Chinese art. But then there are also artists, you know, they, um, they probably, their work, you don't clearly see the connection to uh, traditional Asian art. But that is, you know, as Jay said, um, the Asian American art is American art, or Asian art is the art of the world, you know. So um, just like I always believe in like the composer, you know, Chopin, and he his work doesn't just belong to uh, Poland, but the whole country you now has been so proud of him and we all listen to his music, we remember that country. So I think we would encourage artists to just uh, create their own artwork. In, uh, in the gallery, you know, especially in 2020, we started our inauguration show. I actually invited Xiao Zhe to curate a show. I think at that time we had the wildfire raging in California. 
And with the pandemic, people are deeply concerned about the environmental issues. So we put four artists in that show and we actually have um, three Chinese artists and um, uh, one Asian American artist. Actually, I should say two because the Asian Tong that time also lived in uh, New York. And especially we juxtapose two video artists and Robin O'Neill and Chou An Xiong. Chou An Xiong is a world in a known uh, video artist, but people just, uh, they're shocked to see both artists, their work actually completed uh, before a couple of years before the pandemic, but it's almost like they can foresee it, the issue. And then the two artists, they have totally different language. Um, Chiu An Xiong actually start from our, uh, the new classics of mountain and sea, Xin Shanghai Jin, he calls his work Xin Shanghai Jin, from Shanghai Jin. So it's very, very deeply uh, rooted in the Chinese tradition, but it is so relevant and it's so international and so current. So I think that's how we, um, you know, use this to present Asian art, just to show people it's the asset of the world. We think the same, we deal with the same humanity, just as what Xiaozi, you know, demonstrated in his artwork. So I think that is very important. And for the community in the last three years, you know, each time when we have show, we have mixed media, you know, mixed audience. And uh, of course, sometimes, you know, like if we have like Tian De's work, the one we just made currently up, maybe we have more like Asian uh, audience, they think it will immediately connect to us. But the American audience, they also love it and they would like to tell us more about it. So I think that's a really important way, you know, we use art to empower the people in the society for better communication for a better society. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's a very powerful statement. I uh, really share that your visions and certainly you are in front with working with uh, artists in that environment. And uh, now I'm direct this question to um, Director Jie Xu and uh, compare, you know, what. Uh, Dashia's experience in the in the galleries environment and in in the museum. So as the uh, during your time as a leader there, and uh, how do you see the role of the museums changing to make uh, um, evolving to more relevances there? Yes, I think it's a very important uh, factor is the great richness and diversity of artistic expressions by uh, artists of Asian descent. You know, not only Asian American artists, but also you know, the artists here taking residence, but not necessarily of uh, US or Canadian citizens. So we call Asia diasporic art. I think it's, that's very important. As you started out this question by observing there are certain stereotypes about Asian cultures, whether it's uh, Chinese or the Indian or Japanese, there's always those stereotypes and orientalistic stereotypes associated with uh, Asian cultures, Asian artists. I think we need to break down those stereotypes by showcasing the richness, infinite richness and diversity of Asian American artists and Asian diasporic art. So I think that is very important. I think whether it's an art gallery or a museum, we are the platforms that to showcase this rich diversity and also to demonstrate the connection they the Asian, you know, the, 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 the art created by artists of Asian descent, the connection with uh, the all artistic movements and phenomena in the global setting. So, you know, Asian art, of course, has a particular values and aesthetics and as well history, but also it has this uh, universal shared the pursuit and, uh, and, and, uh, this, and, and the quality. So I think that is very important break down the stereotypes. Thank you very much. Yes, and that's exactly what I like to hear. And I think the audience like to share the break down stereotypes. And that is also um, built into my work because every time I'm talking to our interplay planners and artists and I say, 
when they think about it, you know, Asian art, they all have that few images in their, you know, red lanterns and the, uh, you know, uh, puffy, you know, uh, pandas, and I think, you know, there, there, there's something, you know, we need to break down the barriers. So for time, I'm a little bit conscious about time, and I really wish that I do see there's a question that comes through, and I like really like to have some time to for our audience. So let, let me move on to the next set of questions. Um, so Yanya, if you can put on questions, the next one, there's a little bit uh, more, uh, more, question, but I think I really like to direct this question to our audience rather than just to our our um, audience, uh, our um, panelists alone, because this is all the questions that we really need to, uh, to, to, to think about when we are helping this uh, uh, art and art world to move forward. So Actually, I think uh, both you know our parents already answered this question that I always like push our artists to to think about it is how we define the Asian art in American societies because every time in the past decades very long, so people always stereotype of uh, Asian art is art just uh, talking about art Asian culture or talking about it's all by the Asian people, but. Asian art is American. I think this is the core answers that we have achieved and agreed in this panel. So I'm really glad we reached to that. And how do we define art created by self, define art uh, um, American, Asian Americans or art with elements of Asian tradition? Because sometimes people define the Asian art, always think about, is there any uh, elements about the Asian cultural heritage building, but sometimes not necessary to. I think our panelists already addressed that very clearly in their work, in the arts, in their uh, engagement with the audience, in their leadership in the museum. I think we already have that answer. How does the Asian art plays its role in emerging harmony, as I say, empower people. Dashi just may say empower people to understand the, uh, the culture and the art. And I think uh, we already have many answers to those questions. I'm not going to specifically ask each one of you to address, but I really like to bring this question to our audience. That is something that we need to work together. But I want to leave the next you know, 10, 15 minutes with this question in mind for our panelists and uh, give us something your thought overall that uh, your point of view on this subject and uh, your, your, your final thoughts and uh, your, your message that I'd like to share with our audience today uh, before I open up the floor to the um, public. So I'm going to call upon each of you. So maybe um, start with Jason. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shen. Um, I, I'll just say briefly that um, as a curator hat, um, you know, I hope that my hope with Nikkei Jean Illinois was that while it's telling the story of the Japanese American experience, that the space becomes uh, open for uh, people of Asian American uh, heritage uh, to share their stories. Because as we are aware, uh, Asian histories and Asian American histories are fraught with trauma and, um, you know, and and this hope has come to pass. I've had uh, folks of uh, Filipino descent tell me about their grandparents and how they didn't tell any stories of how the Japanese occupation um, affected their histories and their lives for, as an example. So that's, as the curator, that's what I'd like to say. But as a, a musician and artist, I would like to um, add that I was very, um, intentional in forming my group, Kodoshio, um, while I wanted to feature musicians uh, of Asian descent in this ensemble, you know, we're an improvising ensemble and and uh, very uh, experimental uh, sound is, is created from the grouping that I'm able to present. So I'm not aiming to present Asian music per se, but I'm, I am very curious to, to discover how our uh, combined heritage is 
might be reflected as improvisers, um, but also to create a platform for us to tell stories through our music. And uh, for example, the uh, debut CD that we released on Asian Improv Records, um, we were actually in collaboration with a wonderful visual artist, contemporary artist named Michael Kerner, who is also part Japanese. And in his work, he utilizes his background in chemistry and uh, photographic process to create works exploring his identity um, as a son of parents who experienced weaponized nuclear energy. And so uh, there are several pieces on our debut release that um, are remembering at that time, the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, this idea of creating um, music and recordings that archive these histories, there's a long tradition of it. And I just want to recognize in, in conclusion, uh, artists like Mark Izu and John Jang and uh, Glenn Horiuchi and uh, Francis Wong, whose uh, Legends and Legacies recording is one of my favorite, and artists like Anthony Brown and the uh, Afro uh, of in the Asian American Jazz Orchestra. Uh, he recently released a, a piece called Go for Broke. So, you know, there's a rich tradition of uh, Asian American jazz musicians uh, carrying forward this history and telling our stories. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Professor Shea? Um, yes, thank you. Um, well, this question of uh, self-identification or self-representation uh, is indeed something uh, we cannot really avoid, uh, particularly as an artist, um, because I think an artwork is always deeply connected to the artist's ethnic and cultural background and uh, the social and political environment he lives in. And so well, in the 90s, there was a lot of discussion about um, identity politics, you know, identity art. And identity art uh, uh, is about who you are, is about presentation and self-representation. Uh, so um, as an artist myself, I feel like, um, you know, now I, so I call myself a Chinese American artist, Asian American artist. Well, I've, I try to uh, not uh, strategically label myself um, in a simplistic kind of way. Uh, so I, I want to just, this one bottom line uh, to my work that I want to be true to my personal experiences and my personal feelings in my art. Um, so uh, I, I think part of my work, I mean, in terms of dealing with censorship, I've done installation uh, about the destruction of books by the Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution. I've also done uh, a, a large work uh, based on the burning of books by the Nazis, a whole different uh, uh, time period and, and different uh, uh, reason. And um, so I strive to, um, to present a broader cultural views and uh, to, to uh, capitalize or to take advantage of my living experience in uh, you know, growing up and developing uh, in both countries and uh, experience of uh, traveling to other parts of the world. So um, I guess my, my to, to uh, sum it up is that uh, I you know, uh, try to be, you know, be a more so inclusive, be a more um, you know, multicultural, uh, to have a, a you know broader uh, artistic and, and cultural perspectives, uh, and that uh, is uh, reflected, I hope, uh, in my work. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Dasha. Your time. Um, for me, I think you know art is constantly evolving and breaking our stereotype of definition. So I think this will probably will be the same case with Asian art. Um, I remember Gombrich says something, there really is no such thing as art, but they are only artists. Sounds like very, you know, confusing, but I think he basically emphasized it's the artists themselves. So I believe, you know, as I said, greater art is created from the true self of an artist. Of course, the artist, 
himself or herself, you know, their self, they definitely carry a lot there, um, their own personality, temperament, and their cultural and heritage, the society they grow up. Um, so I think it's a very complex thing there. And that's the fascinating part. So I like to, uh, to see the Asian artists or Asian American artists, they create art from the true self. And if they do that, then we will see a rich, a very rich mixture of, you know, uh, the representation of our culture, their, our, you know, the challenge we face right now. So that's um, how we select the artists. So we, we just want to see the, the artwork is um, touching. And uh, I also encourage the, you know, the Asian American here and people here actually encourage them to see us. Like a couple of days ago, I went to Berkeley Art Museum. I saw artist, I think it's Amania and um, Mesa Basin. So she definitely, you know, she's from a Catholic culture from Mexico. And I see that culture, uh, it's fascinating to me, although it's not the culture I grew up, but I think the issue she touched, I, I understand very well. And that is really the rich part of the art. And that's why I really encourage people to appreciate. Most people believe, you know, um, I mean, some people, I cannot say, some people believe I'm so busy, you know, art has nothing to do with me, but art, art has everything to do with you. It is in the core of the society transformation, um, the power redistribution and the fight for equality. So um, I encourage Asian American to look at art, go to museums and uh, actively participate in the ecosystem of art, you know, either you visit the art center, you fight for the art center's budget, you um, participate in the city's public art projects, or you become a patron for the museum and connect artwork and, uh, you know, display them or donate to the museum, all that you help people to uh, know the Asian culture and the Asian American better. You also know the society better, know yourself better, so you can become a better member in the community. So that's um, pretty much my uh, comment on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dasha. Um, Jay? Um, um, yes. <laughs> sure. Um, my uh, um, final message, as much as to our audiences as to our fe fellow panelists and to myself, and let's connect to the opening remarks I made, is that I see the great momentum of our Asian American community in fighting anti-Asian hate, racism, in raising voices about the all areas of accomplishments, including us and the culture that made to this country and to this continent by people of Asian descent. I think the key in the future to sustain that momentum, grow that momentum for any worthy cause as Asian American art or as difficult a fight as we are facing and we are doing in terms of fighting anti-Asian hate. It takes long time, sustained collective effort, dedication. We cannot be complacent. We could always be working more effectively through collaboration and partnership, not only partnership within Asian American community, but with allyship with all communities. So I hope, you know, we will uh, carry on. And uh, the next time we convene that uh, we have more progress to report. Thanks. Thank you. That's, I am hoping too that for next time, if we have a similar panel like this, we will see where we actually can make a difference from today on. So on that note that uh, we have not done yet, so I think we have another six, uh, seven minutes and we have a few questions in the Q&A box. So I'm going to read them and uh, direct our panelists if you can answer the best as you can. So I have a question from Chris. It is uh, so great 
sorry, the vision a little bit different. It is so great to we uh we hear the language that is attempting attempting to racism, racism, Asian American cultural endowment in the United States, Asian cultural as uh, is as old as Anglo-Saxons, Irish, Germans, and Spanish in the United States. Is there literature or artistic work reflecting the old Japanese farming lexies in North uh, California? I think this question is for Jason. Uh, thank you. Uh, Asian culture is as old as the Anglo, Irish, German, and Spanish in the United States. Is there literature or artistic work reflecting the old Japanese farming legacy in Northern California? Um, oh boy, there's there's um, there's a, a there's a book from Columbia published in Columbia that um, uh, I wish I had this in my memory. The there's a, a, a tales of a Japanese uh, tourist who travels across the United States and and uh, documents uh, through the these stories these short stories uh, things that they they uh, represented uh, uh, things that they experienced along the way and and some of it's very very difficult and there's an English translation of this text. Um, uh, maybe I could look it up real quick and put it in the answer. Um, that would be one thing that that I would refer to. I'm also recently looking at a book uh, about the Tacoma, Washington community. Uh, I found it on archive.org, and um, you know it's a, also a turn of the century uh, uh, historical uh, look at Tacoma and the farming community there. Um, but that's not Northern California. That's that's Tacoma, Washington. So anyway, those are two things that come right up at the top of my head. I'll just leave that there, and I'll look look up the titles right now. Okay, good. Uh, next questions we have here. Again, I uh, my vision is not so great. Do I see uh, see the uh, very strong backlighting? But I'll do my best. So the next question is: Loving the discussion and discovering the cultural output of uh, Asian diasporas in the US. I wonder what the panelists think about the connections of modern and contemporary art to the arts of the colonial and the early period periods in history, as far as representing the full value of Asian art is considered, especially against the background of looted art objects in the US being returned to countries in Asia in measure over the past few years, in the past few years, art market of ancient objects becoming so much more prominent. Does anyone like to start answering the question? I think Jason, you have been touched upon a little bit about your auction experience and maybe, yeah. Uh, um, Jay, you have some experience working in the uh, museum sector. Yeah, I'd be, uh, I'd be happy to answer that question. It's a very complicated and a large question, but it's a very meaningful and important question. So first of all, let's talk about the uh, provenance and uh, the, uh, the the phenomenon of looted art. I think uh, our museum, for example, has one of the best collections of uh, classical Asian art, and uh, some of which are uh, had problems. And we have been leading the effort of uh, returning some of the uh, the art that we don't think is no longer appropriate for us to hold in our collection to their source countries, such as uh, Cambodia, such as Thailand. And uh, the ongoing effort uh, is indeed that we want the United States to be actually holding the highest standard in terms of a cultural uh, provenance and the research and the repatriation if needed. And the other side of the phenomenon is that the art, uh, there are 
category of art meant to be circulation. For example, one of the most uh, highest accomplishments of, uh, of Chinese traditional culture actually is export porcelain. So, so many of the Chinese porcelain are made explicitly for exporting to other countries and because China has the this wonderful technology of making porcelain that no other part of the world could do until the 18th century. So their technology was for the first time we sort of uh, uh, um, and uh, got by Germans. Um, but before that, and you know, China has this a wonderful uh, reputation for porcelain, for silk and uh, the paper. And uh, this is uh, to the admiration of the whole world. That's why you see porcelain everywhere. So I think when we approach the provenance issues, we also must have a very nuanced understanding. And I think uh, to me, it's always important to make inquiries by not making judgment right away. Always confront each museum to tell your story of where your art come from. I think this is a very constructive, important question to impose to all the museum, but rather than making a judgment right away, you see in a Western museum, is art from China automatically it is looted. That is also not completely responsible. So, um, so that said, I think the because we are a museum largely based on traditional art, actually for us to champion contemporary art and Asian American art, we always focus on this connection. The art of the past connecting with the art of the present and to the future. So I think a lot of artists are so very well informed by the past artistic traditions, such as Xiao Zhe right here, I think they can make their new creative inspiring art by drawing inspiration from tradition. Some of the issues that we human beings constantly confront with are timeless. We always want to have a better family. We always want to have a better environment and so on and so forth. So there are issues that transcend time, but there are also issues particular to our time and particular to our region, such as equality and racism, right? And so in this case, you know, we can look at the connection, but also to see that how we can ask in the question about past using today's perspective, right? Every generation have a new question. So that art, no matter when, how old it was made, it always has potential to provide new answers as much as the contemporary art that are being made by artists today. So that is called my uh, summary answer. I hope it makes sense. Thank you very much, uh, Jay. Let's also, I share that uh, uh, sentiments as well. Uh, and since I work in the field uh, very closely with you, and uh, this is something that uh, the museums is now open for discussion. We are not hiding things behind, but I think we need a mutual understanding of our side about uh, uh, history. So anyway, the time is out, but I do want to share one last comment. It's a question, but it's uh, more like a, a, a comment I'd like to share with all of you. And I think this is a question as a more, with a more criticism to the, uh, uh, the uh, University Art Museum. So let me just read it. Uh, the panel has posted questions that are so important. Thank you. However, let us consider the art historical and the curatorial situation at the UIUC, the uh, Krenet Art Museum, the University Art Museum, uh, disseminated uh, its Asian gallery years ago and still refused to reestablish the gallery, except the few Chinese ceramics that are exhibited in the basement hallway of East Asian art objects have been put into storage. Suggestions as to how we might resurrect the uh, Asian galleries, which was originally an integral part. Oops, and there, someone was jumping on the head. Um, because of uh, part of uh, you know, I lost the uh, because the question was. Uh, I'm, up. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I put an answer in there. I'm sorry. To so that's why you missed. Um, up so, with. So, so let's just, go to answered question. 
Su yeah. Suggestions as to how we might resurrect the Asian gallery, which was originally an integral part of the museum situated next to the African gallery. I'm sorry, Thank I didn't you, realize Jesse. that it would that it would yeah, move. Uh, I, I just I think we, it, yeah, I don't think we have the answers for now. And uh, I, I just uh, feel, you know, we need to share something, a voice like this. And I know you, Jason, and Professor Shaw will take that, uh, that comments to your discussion at the UIC, uh, UIUC. So I'm not going to get into it. Uh, I'm just apologize for my visions because I'm uh, not correct on my reading glass for, for the reading that. Thank you, Jason, for that. So on that note, I want to thank all the panelists today to have this uh, wonderful, dynamic, and very powerful discussions uh, with us. Professor together. Shen, may I uh, interrupt? Actually, we have uh, more questions below. I don't so, know whether we have time. Yeah. I, I'm conscious about your audience. So uh, how about we just to we answer it? How about um, uh, Jason? You read those questions for everyone before we close. All right, we we, we had um. Do, we didn't do this on loving the discussion and discovering the cultural output of Asian diasporas in the U.S. I wonder what the panelists think about the connections of modern and contemporary art to the arts of the colonial and earlier periods. This one is this one that, we already read. That one was it. We, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. We start from S. Low. Okay. Okay. Uh, Eslo asked if this was the title, The Four Immigrants Manga, A Japanese Experience in San Francisco, 1904 to 1924, uh, 1991, 1999 paperback. Um, that is not the, the books that I was um, referring to. The books I was referring to were American Stories by Nagai Kafu, uh, which is on the Columbia, and I put that in the answers. And then the other book that you can find online in archive.org is uh, Fordu Sato, uh, Tacoma Pierce County Japanese is the title by Ronald Magden. Um, but thank you for adding that book. And I'm going to look it up myself uh, for immigrants manga, a Japanese experience in San Francisco. The uh, anonymous attendee also uh, added the problems with selling and commodifying cultural material was brought up a few times. Would any of the panelists be able to speak to their experience with this more in terms of if you feel a need to create Asian imagery and or may feel averse to this. As an Asian American artist, I am often naturally drawn to create certain cultural imagery, but sometimes feel hesitant to do this as it may be orientalized by Western viewership or feel that I become dismissed as just another quote unquote cultural artist. Would anybody like to address that quick, quickly? Um, I think as a gallerist, I want to say a few words about that. Um, as I said, I think, you know, um, art is created like deeply from your true self. And it's not just say, I need this imagery for a certain reason. I think that it really echoes inside of you, uh, then, you know, you use it or, how you use it. I think it's basically convey uh, what is inside of you, what is yearning inside of you. Uh, not just say, maybe this can be, you know, create, make, make this image more uh, decorative or more uh, towards certain things. Um, so that's what I would say from an artist's work. You know, what image you use, uh, not necessarily if you put, um, a traditional Asian image there, that means uh, it carries the message. So that's my personal. Um... Uh, thank you very much. I think so with the time's running out, I know we have more question to answer. Usually this is a great sign. And uh, what the uh, the practice we could have, what we can do is uh, maybe Dr. Uh, Professor Sal and Yang Yang, you can direct those questions to our panelists, and we hope our panelists are able to answer those questions over the emails after that, just for the cautious of the time and uh, people's participation and anticipations about the panel. And I would like to turn this uh, uh, forum to back to uh, Professor Xiao. Okay, Yang Yang, can you copy paste those questions and forward to the panelists? Maybe uh, we can collect answers from them uh, after uh, we wrap up session yeah sure yeah 
Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining us today. And I really appreciate your spending time with us on such a lovely uh, uh, day on June uh, uh, 2nd of this year. And also, it's our great honor uh, to host every panelist here, uh, Dr. Jay Xu, uh, Professor Xiao Zexie, Dr. Dacia Xu, and uh, uh, Director Brinkman. Uh, and thousands of thanks to uh, Dr. Shen Chen for chairing this panel. So let's uh, stop here. And again, uh, thousands of thanks to everyone. And I believe uh, my answer to the question about UIUC's <laughs> gallery, uh, this uh, panel, maybe we should regard it as our first step to do something and see what we can change or what changes we can bring to our gallery and our museum here on campus. Thank you so much. And for those whose answers have not been answered, I uh, highly recommend you can either contact me or con contact our panelists uh, uh, via us uh, uh, by email uh, after the panel. Okay, thank you again. <laughs>